Okay chaps, I'm now going to, uh, this is the next instalment in my series of motorcycles that I own. Um, today, slightly tongue in cheek, I'm going to attempt to persuade you that this Norton 16H is one of the world's great motorcycles. Perhaps up there in the top five or something, who knows. Um, but yes, that, that, that's my um, proposition. Don't all laugh, but um, I'm going to have a go at this, okay? Um, the Norton 6, Model 16 was first launched in about 1911, I think, 1911. Um, uh, in the beginning, the Magneto, which um, we can see mounted here, was mounted over the front, which wasn't a very good place because it was subject to um, all the uh, weather hitting it. Um, after the First World War, and initially um, before the First World War, the bike had the engine and in, in a, what was then not much more than a glorified bicycle frame, had um, very good sporting successes. But fairly quickly after the First War, the bike became a, um, a, a sort of slave of all work, really. It became every man's motorcycle. There were two two um, models, if you like, to this. There was the 16H, which that's what this is, and the 16C. The, the 16H standed for home, the home model that was built for um, domestic sales. The 16C was the colonial model, which was exported all over the world. So hundreds and hundreds of thousands of 16Cs saw service, delivering the King Emperor's mail in the Punjab, ranching in the Australian outback, climbing the Rockies in the ca Canadian, Canadian um, forests, perhaps carrying administrators throughout Africa from time to time. Um, one of the reasons that uh, I've chosen this backdrop here, the stable yard, is because this was perhaps one of the main um, pieces of machinery, main transport machinery that replaced the horse. Um, before, before the Norton 16H came along and similar, um, man relied upon the horse, but this replaced it. The, um, it's a 500cc motorcycle, single cylinder, side valve. The valves are here and, and are at the side of the of what is the cylinder rather than mounted on the top there. Um, this gives it very sort of ploddy, talky characteristics and um, it made the bicycle very suitable for hauling a sidecar. By the time we get to 1939, this bike is certainly no longer a sporting motorcycle but has become um, an everyday motorcycle and a motorcycle for hauling sidecars. Come the war, um, hundreds of thousands of these were made and saw war, war service as dispatch riders mounts. Um, they were a favourite of the dispatch rider because they were very easy to maintain, very reliable, reasonably fast, you know, 65 miles an hour, something like that perhaps, um, in solo gearing, and uh, easy to start and look after. After the war, the motorcycle was still in production and was primarily sold as a sidecar lugger. And in fact, production went up on until the late 50s, maybe 1960. So we're seeing a, a 50 year production run of this motorcycle. Uh, following its early development in, um, to move the Magneto back, uh, there wasn't a lot of change really. Um, you know, you look at pre-war, 16 inches and they look very similar to this we've got rigid suspension on the back earlier ones would have had um, girder forks this has got this is the 1947 model so it's got the long road holder tele hydraulic forks um, but sort of earlier models would have looked very very similar we will now take a closer look at the bike excuse the cat um, she lives down the stables and um, is a much more humane way of get it keeping the rats at bay just feed the cat and we don't see any rats right let's out the way pussy let's have a look at the engine here we go 
79 millimeters by 100 millimeters that 79 millimeters is the bore and 100 the stroke so a long stroke engine you can see that little aluminium thing with a round nut on it above the main engine casing that is uh, where you go in there and adjust the tappets at the back here we have an amol separate float chamber carburetor very standard fitment a piggybacked dynamo six volt dynamo on top of the magneto there at the back being driven off the engine Norton gearbox notice how how proud Norton were of their um, logo you get it on the gearbox get it on the engine casing on the tank on the knee pad and up above you'll see it on the steering damper later toolbox at the back it was always uh, very necessary to carry tools with any old motorcycle they inevitably need a degree of fettling, although this motorcycle was perhaps one of the most reliable. Um, solid, susp no suspension on the back there. Although we do have a little pillion seat for um, those with a strong enough to back to take the lack of suspension. And here we have the comfortable pan saddle for the rider. Notice the nice big deep springs which make up for the lack of suspension. And nestling there, just under the saddle, is the voltage regulator, which um, controls the voltage coming from dynamo and makes sure that the battery is not overcharged. Coming around the bike, standard Dunlop rims on the front there, seven inch brake, which is, doesn't do an awful lot. Um, long road holder forks, a headlight coming around the back very small front light back light sorry back light there we are uh, no stop light didn't need a stop light in 1947 attached to the bicycle is a Watsonian Monaco sidecar single seater what was known in those days as a sporting sidecar uh, there were other types such as a double adult which would carry two people two grown people or a child adult which was one a child behind the adult in the front so there we have the monaco what's only a monaco the, the sidecar probably is a bit later than the um, motorcycle i would guess i don't know its date of origin but i would guess early 50s let's come around and have a look at the um just before we go to the rider's position, that there is the oil tank, um, where the, it's a, which carries the oil um, for circulation around the engine. Taking the driver's view, typical Norton paintwork. This tank's got one or two little dents in it. It's no doubt tell some stories. Um, here we have the rider's view. As you can see, the, uh, the great big steering damper with the Norton logo emblazoned upon it, speedometer, ammeter, want to see that little needle going to the right when it's running, that shows that there's a nice healthy charge coming from the dynamo, and the switch for the light, side light and headlight. Over here on the handlebars we have the sort of main controls, a dip switch and um, horn button, advanced retard. Now, for those that uh, are uh, used to more modern motorcycles, this uh, alters the ignition timing. So, to start the, the uh, motorcycle, it's a good idea to retard the ignition a bit to stop it kicking back. It also slows down the tick over uh, when you're just when the bike's just ticking over. Normal running is you run run the bike with the ignition fully advanced. Clutch lever there. Over here, a. Um, choke lever and brake lever I fitted a wing mirror to it which is pretty so although it's a new wing mirror it's very similar to those that might have been fitted when the bike was new this bike is more or less unchanged from when it came out the factory as close as you're going to get as you can see it's what is known as oily rag condition it's not been polished or chromed out of uh, into something that it wasn't it's maintained well, it runs well, but it's not um, cosmetically um, polished 
and re-chromed and repainted. It is as it was. Obviously, it would have looked rather smarter when it came out of Bracebridge Street uh, in Birmingham in 1947, but it's had, um, had a lot of use since then. It's still looking good. Okay, now let's go through the starting procedure. Um, you'd normally turn the tap on there, it's already on, and you would tickle the carburetor here just to flood it slightly. Now I'm not going to do that because this bike has recently been fired up, so it should um, more or less fire as it is. So the first thing to do is push the kickstart lever down till you feel resistance. That's on compression. And under here is a little lever that we pull that releases the compression and allows you to push the kickstart to pass the compression, let it come back up. Now, if we give it a big good kick, it may well start. Sometimes it doesn't. Another one. This is now in the place where it's not really cold and it's not really hot, so it's, it's sometimes difficult to figure exactly what you might do with it. Oh, yeah, you see that kickback? I retarded, I advanced the ignition a bit. motorcycles it depends how you measure a motorcycle um, if you measure it on speed it's obviously nowhere near it um, if you measure it on some sort of perception of glamorous good looks it's very subjective if you measure it on on a production run um, sales and simply the ability to get you from A to B in comfort and with a pretty high degree of certainty that you're going to get there, this has got to be one of the all-time winners. This this motorcycle has been doing exactly that um, for you know, well, it's still going now, but in it, its production run, which was about 50 years, and here we have a motorcycle that is now, um, well, where are we? 2017. The design of this motorcycle is um, over 100 years old. I bought it before Christmas, went down to Devon, pick it up from the old boy who could no longer ride it. We uh, started it up in his garage. He gave me a high-vis jacket because it was very foggy down in Devon on that um, early December morning. And I just got across it and rode it all the way back to Kent. Uh, did not miss a beat. Just sat on the A303, steady 50 mile an hour, and that engine felt and sounded as if it would go on forever. When I got it back, I checked the oil level. Yes, it had used a bit of oil, not an awful lot, perhaps a quarter of a pint. Um, there was no oil usage in the primary chain case. That was up to level, uh, and so was the gearbox. So, um, and I'm not particularly young, um, suffering from the usual sort of achy backs and all these things that you get when you're older but I sat on that motorcycle for the what it what, whatever it was 180 odd miles or something um, over a period of perhaps about six hours to get back and um, I felt fine I got in sat down watched television um, had a meal talked to my wife checked my emails I felt absolutely fine very comfortable motorcycle ride it all day long um, so that, that's my claim for saying this is one of the world's great motorcycles. Um, some of you may think it was the Vincent Black Shadow or maybe some sort of Kawasaki Ninja. But for me, if I had to choose a motorcycle to go around the world on, this would be the one. <laughs> 